Hello, everyone. Welcome to Popcast on the Rocks, episode 145. We're a show that talks about pop culture, things that interest us, and sometimes there's whiskey. My name is John, and I'm joined, as always, by Andrea. How's it going? Good, good. Happy Wednesday. Happy middle yeah. of the week. Getting through the work week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hump day. It's perfect. Uh, oh, days good. still, yeah, <laughs> days still feel like, you know, the actual day feels meaningless to me still. Um, oh, sure. Still just, you know, with my weird work and then the kids, it's just whatever right. day is any day. So yep, today is a day. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but uh, MJ is in chat and uh, MJ. welcome in MJ, MJ Honeybee. Everybody should make sure they check her out on Twitch and on YouTube. She has lots of clip, clips and stuff on, on YouTube as well. So we thank her for being in here right away. Um, <laughs> she's making fun of my, my mess ups already. Um, today we're going to be talking a lot about two topics. Um, first will be the dark night and the anniversary that it just celebrated yesterday. Um, so I want to get a little nostalgic about that. And then, um, Mission Impossible. So the new Mission Impossible movie is out now, has been out the seventh entry in the series. And, um, we're going to look back at the previous films and, uh, see what, how they age, what we think of them now. And, um, you know, the series as a whole. So. Uh, MJ says she's watched Mission Impossible. That's awesome. I wish I was had been able to as well. Uh, so this will be strictly about the previous Mission Impossible movies, not the new the new one. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought I thought she was commenting that she had watched like the first Mission Impossible. Oh, and maybe. I wish I had too. It was like, oh God, I didn't understand the assignment. I <laughs> like John didn't go back and rewatch them. <laughs> no, I've I've been rewatching them. I mean, slowly over the last several several months, really, and kind of like sped through these last few now, uh, leading up to yeah. the show. But uh, yeah, so well, um, through relatively, I imagine, because they are long movies, which I did not remember. Oh, okay, all, like, okay. You know these what I mean? Ones. On the average. The, yeah, the last ones are like two and a half plus. Sure. Yep. So. Such are the times. Indeed. Um, before that, you know, we got just a few new releases. Maybe we'll touch on. We got our weeks. You've got a whole litany of uh, Disney shows you need to uh, address. And um, but we should kick things off with our drink holidays per usual. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, There's been quite a few since we've been absent. Um, a little bit longer than usual. So traveling all the way back to uh, July 7th, it's dive bar day. Um, so if you've ever had a favorite dive bar, I don't know, I would celebrate by going out to it. Sure. Not just like staying home and making your favorite drink, like go out to your favorite dive I, bar. I mean, in places I lived, I wasn't like walking distance to sure. bars generally. Um, and so I didn't really have like a, I never really had a neighborhood kind of grungy dive bar spot. Have you, did you, I mean, do you have a yeah, go-to? I mean, w when I immediately think dive bar, I think of like my college bar, uh, down oh, in St. Pierre right. next to Gustavus Patty's. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just like the place, like it's yeah. everybody's place. And, um, it's just like, so iconic you know what i mean like everybody talks mm -hmm. about it or like what you're gonna do there or like who was riding the bus down to Patty. what you were gonna do there i don't know drink profusely well, well, yeah and then I'm, the I'm, bathroom walls. Drinking. uh <laughs> i'm thinking of someone specifically yeah yeah who yes who could that be um but yeah you know i mean like was it like a music night was it like dance club night was it just like you know you're going down to like have a couple beers or whatever or was there like a mm -hmm. sponsored we had some like um sponsored like sorority activities down there we had like different nights stuff like that so you know i mean obviously it was all about like drinking but yeah what kind of night was it gonna be so 
Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Fun, Maybe fun that's memory. my favorite dive bar yeah, then too, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. You have some fond memories there too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, but anyway, July 7th dive bar day. Um, if you think about it, you know, patronize your favorite dive bar. Uh, July 10th, it was Pina Colada day. Very fitting for the month of July. When you think about summery tropical yeah. drinks, it's kind of the pinnacle, I think. Um, following day, Mojito Day, which I haven't had in a long time. Sounded good. Unfortunately, I didn't have the stuff for it. Mm. So I went a different direction with my drink tonight, but I was kind of craving that. I mean, I'm that's a good to, summer drink, too. I agree. I agree. Pina Colada versus Mojito. Yeah, that's pretty good. I know what yeah. I would prefer. I'm just saying, I feel like when people think like, like name an iconic summer drink or like mm -hmm. think of it like visualize it in your head i just feel like pina coladas come to mind because they always yes on straws that and imagery yes and yeah mm -hmm. so um the the next day there's a whole slew of them right in a row uh july 12th michelada day michelada day i said michelada okay i feel day. like i always I do know. this where I'm like, I don't know which one it is, so I'm just gonna like question mark. Somebody knows somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I don't. And uh, then uh, okay, yeah. you don't know. You don't know for sure. Yeah, yeah I don't yeah. either. So, um, and then July 14th, National Grand Marnier Day and Bastille Day. If you are okay. French and you want to celebrate a national holiday, that's the holiday. Alan says Renato would know about uh, Michelada Day. Well, where is he? Renato? Huh? Where are yeah. you? Yeah. Let us know. Can I phone a friend, please? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> this yep. works, like, how, who wants to be a millionaire? Can I phone a friend? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, Bastille Day. That just happened or yep. was about July, to happen? July 14th is... It was the 14th. Is, okay. Um, was the 14th so it was apparently okay. a subject debate when they were making it a national holiday because there were like several different dates of like what they consider like independence and liberation um involving storming the bastille and so there was like some debate about which date to choose because there were several like bloodier uprisings and like a lot of politicians were like well, we don't really want to celebrate like death and destruction and chaos so they kind of all had to like agree on like what was going to be the official day while acknowledging that like you know no up almost no uprising is bloodless and you know you sure. still celebrate the spirit of like fighting for independence so right right july 14th is what they've landed on it's yeah it's one of those things like uh i mean i understand what you're saying but it's the same as people like you, you know, you don't not celebrate a historic figure because, well, they did this thing wrong. You're choosing to celebrate a specific asset or a, or the thing they were predominantly remembered for. And so if like, you know, you're, you're picking a day here, yeah, you're not focusing on whatever be the negative. You're saying, look, the, the point of this was this that we're celebrating and therefore you know, that's, that's, you know, it's not like we're having this day and we're celebrating bloodshed. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some like wisdom in being like, you know, let's not like champion something totally gross. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if, if you're like saying, okay, we're going to pick this day and we're just going to like acknowledge this portion of it while also being like, obviously don't condone these actions. Like, yeah, like, this actually dovetails in perfectly with what I want to talk about with my week. Um, okay. Because I watched a lot of Disney movies and, and like Disney related. Um, so we're, we're doing like a, we started off with like a Disney summer um, forever at where we've been watching one Disney movie a day and we've been going alphabetically. And I talked about this before on the, on the, po on the podcast and we were only like through the letter E we're now through like the letter P We've gotten nice. quite a bit farther, um, but we've we've kind of had to make some like adjustments because 
Disney doesn't have like a great animated movie for every letter of the alphabet. Sure. Um, yeah, I see what you did like, here. Yep. N was scarce. Mm -hmm. um, so we were we were trying to stick with an animated theme. So we didn't want to do like Newsies was their kind of offering of a musical. Mm -hmm. um, and then they also, for something animated, had Nightmare Before Christmas. We mm -hmm. were like, Evie might be like a tad young. She is only two. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, don't really mm -hmm. want her to like get freaked out by Mr. Oogie Boogie. Um, so we kind of had to like stretch a little bit and do Finding Nemo <laughs> as sure. our end yeah. movie. A lot of people would just say Nemo. I think that's fair. Right? Like, I think it's fair. You know, so we, we stretched it a little bit. But anyway, um, so how this ties into what we we're talking about is, um, there are definitely several Disney movies, um, that on rewatch are a bit problematic. Um, mm. or have some pretty racist depictions. Um, and Disney chose to not take out those scenes, um, mm -hmm. but instead put like a disclaimer before the movie. I missed it when we watched Dumbo, but I caught it when we watched um, Lady and the Tramp and Peter Pan. Okay. And so they have like an acknowledgement at the beginning of the movie that's like, hey, there are some, you know, pretty racist things in here. Um, and we acknowledge that this was written in a different time where, you know, people didn't consider that as strongly in creating this material. You know, we acknowledge that it is like racist. And if you want to learn more, here's like a link to go to to like have a discussion about sure. This. And we talked a while ago on the podcast about, you know, people like taking things like different content out of books or movies or whatever. And I had said, you know, disclaimers, I think, and like, um, you know, contextual editing is the way to go. And so this was the first time I had seen that in action. And I really liked it. I thought okay. Disney did like a really nice, thoughtful job of saying like, hey, this content is still in our movie because it's the movie that was created. But we want to acknowledge that like we should be having a conversation around it and around like the context in which it was created. So, sure. I don't yeah, I, I know if... that's like a bit more political than we get or, you know, kind of in the politically charged sphere, but I did want to acknowledge that I thought Disney did a really nice job on that of like leaving content in, but saying, let's have a conversation. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I don't, like it's been years since I've seen any of these things. And so, and, and when I saw most of them, that would have been as a kid and kids aren't going to notice right. stuff, you know, or whatever. No. And, um, so I don't, I, you know, I can't comment on the specific situations or, or examples, but I just will say, yeah, in general, if someone as a company owns some property and you now feel there is some issue with it, this is the way to handle it with, disclaimer and let people because otherwise i just it, on we've talked about this before like you said it's it's you're either whitewashing history you're pretending something didn't happen which doesn't help anybody in terms of like the future you know don't don't hide history you know and then um you know to see how people have changed progressed better or worse you know like we want to that, that's important and then just a, yeah. on the sense of from art you know, just like whatever art you someone has created, it's that's what it is. You don't go and mm -hmm. change the Mona Lisa because we don't like whatever about it. Doesn't matter. It's mm -hmm. it is what it is. Same as as Shakespeare. You just it is what it is, and it will be what it is, and it should be. And that's why, like, I recently bought Ashley and I bought seasons one through eight of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia because oh, okay. They've already have taken down some episodes, and it's just like one of those things. Like when living in the digital era, and I'm glad Disney is doing this route now because others are taking other routes and just like removing stuff or or editing it. Um, you know, the thing we I think I brought it up a, quite a while ago where they were taking out like people holding cigarettes and movie posters and some of that. It's just like when everything is digital, it can all be wiped away. And, uh, so 
yeah, if you care about something, try to get it physically, try to own it if you can or whatever. And uh, fortunately for now, anyways, you know, because right now, otherwise we're in, we're in the hands of the, you know, the streaming services and whoever owns the IP, of course, for the preservation of it. So, yeah, I mean, I even, I don't know. I mean, I have my own opinions about this and, and anybody can, you know, at me with your own take on, you know, however this should be handled. But like, I would even prefer just removing content altogether rather than like, removing sections or scenes or trying to CGI out like I don't know a cigarette or whatever it's just like if you feel that strongly like and you maybe need to take a beat and think like I don't know if I want this on my platform and you have the rights to it that's your choice um but yeah I mean like again I just thought this was the way to to go Disney just being like hey we know this is in here it's not great (laughs) I mean, mm-hmm. they use they use obviously different language than what I'm paraphrasing sure. right now, but yep. I just think like the way to handle it is to say like we acknowledge it, we want you know to further the conversation rather than just like taking it out and not talking about it. So, yep. Yeah, it was yep. kind of a it was kind of a funny thing. I didn't really expect um, from you know kind of what started out as just like oh like let's watch a Disney movie a day and we're you know watching Frozen and. She's, you know, singing along to Moana and, you know, wanting to get on on the ocean and stuff like that. And then, yeah, some of these movies were just like, oh, there's a little serious beat here. Sure. Sure. So. All right. Um, well, before you talk any further about your week, um, or if there's anything else you have to say about these Disney movies and such, um, you should tell us what you're drinking. Yes. So um, I really wanted a mojito, did not have the right stuff for it, unfortunately. Um, So I went with a classic Celebrate Bastille Day because I did learn a little bit more about it because I know we I've always mentioned it on the podcast and I haven't really like looked at it. Mm -hmm. So I went with something I know how to make. That's a classic. Um, I went with a French 75. Nice. Gin, simple syrup and champagne. Nice. I have a number of cocktails that uh, require champagne. I don't typically keep that around. I've been thinking about getting some of those small bottles, you know, they're just, I just want to keep, I think I want to do that maybe because I don't normally drink champagne, but I do want it for cocktails. Add some bubbly. Yeah. Same. Same. Yeah. No, I had, uh, I had just, um, you know, visited the liquor store and and uh got us some new wine and like consciously thought about like oh, there are a lot of drinks out there now that have like champagne or prosecco or whatever so i just want to yeah keep a little something on hand and then here we go right yep. away perfect um well i started up again i thought tonight would be a good night to do it and making another drink from my yeah, gotham city drinks. cocktails book is there something um, that uh, is related to the Dark Knight? Um, yeah, yeah, actually. Um, I mean, it's not specifically calling out the Dark Knight, but uh, but yeah, um, I'm doing a drink called a Flip of a Coin, so you can guess nice. what that's about. So, yes. unable to make a clear decision on his own, Two Face relies on the flip of his coin to determine his courses of action. One side of his coin is unblemished. The other is deeply scarred. The side that turns up decides which of his personalities will win. Two-Face was an easy target for Gotham City's bartenders as they set to work creating a number of popular flips, which he began, which began appearing in, sorry, when he began appearing in news headlines. Reward yourself with the amazing froth and luscious consistency of this winning drink. So, um... It is whiskey, Cointreau, lemon juice, an egg, super fine sugar, and nutmeg for garnish. So that's what I've got tonight. Um, here it be. Ooh. The camera one. There it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Check you fancy, mm-hmm. fancy man. So, yeah, it's the first, like, I've made a proper cocktail in a little while, other than, like, off the show, I was making these watermelon soju cocktails. Okay. But Ooh, that sounds good. That sounds uh, like a refreshing summer drink. Continuing on yeah. back from earlier. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a really, um, it's very good. It's very dangerous for sure. Um, I'm sure. I'm, yeah. Yeah. 
but this is uh this is also really good very creamy throw that egg in there always uh adds to the mouth feel and it's you know it's a fun like there's the warming of nut, the nutmeg and stuff but uh you still have plenty of citrus and i'm using an irish whiskey in here it just says whiskey i'm using irish one because to me when i think of two face i'm always thinking kind of mob boss sort of thing so east coast mob it's kind of irish mob okay. sort of okay. mentality here is what i was yeah. thinking no, i get you um I get you. like boston same. area yeah uh, like mm -hmm. yeah no i get i get you yep so yeah so uh i didn't come full two face makeup i just had to deal with a drink <laughs> uh, cheers all right did, um did ashley what else? do that didn't she once she was two face once yes yeah for halloween like we celebrated a long i mean a long long time ago mm -hmm. she was two face right she was two face i don't you know i can't remember if it was for halloween specifically i know she went to a comic convention dressed as two face so maybe you saw yeah. her and she's going for that but she was also yeah. catwoman one halloween and then also poison ivy one halloween so yes yeah lots of bond villains or yep. thoughts of bond villains lots of batman villains <laughs> <laughs> a little slip of the tongue so, there <laughs> yeah so yeah we're thinking like it'd be fun this halloween or something to do like our kids would be batman and batgirl or something and we'd be villains or something like that so. love it. Love it. <laughs> it's always fun to do like a villains you know celebration or like do a villains costume they always have like fun stuff mm -hmm. yep um well what else do you get to this week um i mean obviously disney was like a lot of content so that predominant a yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> um but uh and it was really fun actually because uh chris has been watching some of these movies for the first time like i've seen mm. everything on here um except for oh um that was another actually randomly tricky one um, but we found the the movie Open Season, which is a, a cute little um, movie about animals, what they do, like how they freak out during like hunting season and stuff like that. Mm. Um, broad brush strokes. Um, but other than Disney movies, um, I've watched the new episodes of uh, Jujutsu Kaisen. I watched Zom 100, a new anime on Netflix, which I very highly recommend. I watched um season one episodes one and two and okay. i think it's one of those rare animes that doesn't have too much exposition for me but it has like just enough to like give me some good background um and like care about the character and like his journey but it's not like oh god please stop talking like get to the point already so yeah um, that has been very enjoyable i watched uh episode two of season three of the witcher um, this one was a little bit more chaotic, so I wasn't, um, enjoying it as much as the first, because it felt like a little all over the place, but, you know, I'm still willing to go through season three of The Witcher just to see what happens. Um, okay. and then, I mean, since we've, we've talked last, obviously finished up all my six MI movies, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Busy. Nice. <laughs> um okay yeah i've um i wanted to like i've done a lot in the last uh couple weeks here like you said the mission impossible movies um i just happened to like finish the dark knight rises the other day um nice. so i thought that was a quid incidence but i wanted to do a couple reviews um once for a movie called nefarious and it's kind of a I thought it was going to be more of a horror movie than it is. Um, it's more of a thriller because my initial it understanding was it'd be, what is it? It's based on a book and it's um, kind of a real Christian worldview sort of thriller where someone is going to be, they're on death row, they're going to be executed. And that person claims that they are possessed by a demon. And so yeah, person has to come in and determine whether they 
are insane and therefore not eligible to be executed or they you know are in their you know in their with their wits and uh, and then can be executed and so that's like generally the premise um it's definitely like low budget because you know it's mostly contained to a room so the writing has to be good to make it enthralling and um i really was like i know a bunch of people are going to be not happy with the again very christian worldview um it's definitely like making an argument for um christianity and morality and the lack of it uh in today's world and some of that um but i think that one the person that's playing the possessed person is does an incredible job like should be up for awards like definitely made me feel uh what he wanted me to feel so i thought that was very well done um and definitely the standout of the whole thing and i am into theology and i like the discussion that was had so um i was definitely in it the whole way it's not super long um it's I don't love the way it ended. Um, just, I don't know, something didn't feel satisfying about it. And then they try to make kind of do this sort of it's not over kind of ending like a lot of mm. horror things do. Um, mm -hmm. But again, this really wasn't horror. It was it more was suspense or something yeah. like that, you know. But um, yeah, overall, like I, I definitely recommend it if you're interested in hearing the, you know, if people's opposing viewpoints send, you know, fire signals to your brain and it like, it, you know, it's going to be not enjoyable, like then probably don't watch it because it's going to have two strong viewpoints in it. Um, but other than that, if you're, if you're interested in like hearing what I think of a kind of realistic demon representation would say to a human, I think I think it's probably the best of that because a lot of times you have a possession. It's, it's always like, how do you make a possession movie different? Mm -hmm. I love possession movies and the idea of it, exorcism movies and all that sort of thing. But a lot of it's been done and seen before. And so how do you make it interesting still? And the idea that we would have a demon that would say, hey, I am a demon and here is what I think and try to trick you into things and stuff. I think is better than uh, a lot of times just the laughing at you and the screams of the person. And like, there's not usually an intelligent, much of intelligent conversation other than maybe just trying to goad someone into something like pretend you're like, we kind of like we saw with uh, evil dead rise. Oh, pretend say, I'm your mother now evil again dead or ride, something like yeah. that. Right. <laughs> so it's when it's not that kind of thing. And, and uh, again, the, the main actor is just really good. Uh, like I just, I heard people rave about the, his acting job and, uh, you know, but I was prepared to be let down with that. Um, but yeah. it was very good because was it, I don't know if I'm, was it, I mean, anywhere in the ballpark of like the actress who played Ellie in evil dead rise. Cause I thought she did the mom I thought she did, um, like, especially physically she was insane. Amazing in that movie. Here's the difference is that okay. this person, so Alan looked up, says Sean Patrick uh, Flannery. Um, the difference I is this name. person has to go picture, like 180 from one thing to another and does it so well. Yeah. Sorry. I'm looking at the picture of him. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely recognize him. So, yeah, he did a great. Okay, so one, 180 from one thing to another? Yeah, from like... Okay. From, from demon to the person he's possessed, so good. It, yeah, so very good. Okay. Um, no, I mean, I think I would be interested in that. I mean, I know, I mean, theological debates and discussion and, and content is not everybody's jam, but I really enjoyed... Um, you know, the part that discussing religion played in, um, oh my gosh, our show, Raised by Wolves. 
I had oh, it right. on the tip of my tongue. And then immediately as I was about to say it, my brain was like, no, I'm just going to erase that from your mind. Um, <laughs> Cause that was, that was obviously like very like r- religiously focused in terms of like, here is one group of people who have built their, their civilization and their way of life around, you know, worship of a religious figure. And then here's like the exact opposite. And like, how are we going to like have them interact with each other, build a new civilization, you know, explore the universe. Yeah. So here's, here would be a critique, I guess. Uh, So again, I really enjoyed it, but um, it's a very intelligent conversation from the perspective of arguing the Christian point of view. It's not as intelligent of a response. So, like less lensy. Yeah, I feel like there are two things to consider rather than like, yes, here's the thing. Yeah. Yes. So, um, I would, I would say that what this does well then is that it's, it gives a real, what I would say is a realistic, it gives a very intelligent Christian perspective and then a very realistic, normal person perspective from on the on maybe the other side not not a not a yeah but like a normal person you know okay most people yeah yeah just trying to get what like you're saying by normal person if they're like just like yeah oh i don't mean it like yeah so what i mean in that is like um uh i don't mean normal as in not religious i mean normal in the sense that most people don't know why they think what they think and they can't necessarily uh explain it well they can't i've had a lot of religious conversations with people throughout my life and political ones and most people can't put you know letter to paper express why they think what they're thinking intelligibly really like and so there's an intelligent conversation being had from the christian point of view and the other person is like someone you'd find on the street that is going about their life and maybe is not thinking about this all that much. And when they have to think about it, they realize that maybe they haven't that much, or they don't know why yeah. they've come to such conclusions. And so it, it's not a debate in that sense where you'd theoretically in a debate have two people that can both, you know, expel very well their points of view and that goes head to head. Um, I would say that's a criticism if there's going to be one, but for the character in the film, that makes sense. You know, we're not having a demon debate, uh, Bishop, you know, it's sure. not, or, you know, it's, or, or a demon debate, Richard Dawkins, you know, it's not, uh, it's not that sort of thing. It's like sure. the demon is debating a regular lawyer, you know, or mm-hmm. it's not a lawyer. Sorry. He's a psych- psychiatrist. So, because he's got to deem the metal, mental capacity and stuff for them. So, so that'd be just setting all the expectations up for everybody um, going into this. So, that'll make sense. Oh my God. Yes. Yes. It does. Sorry. Ellen added uh, Sean Patrick Flannery was Gunpowder in the Boys. And I, uh, I <laughs> forgot about that. Wow. Yeah. I didn't even recognize him, but uh, yeah. Okay. He looks a lot yeah. different. Um, he should be nominated for an award. Like voice. it's so good. It's so good. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to review is something I find, well, I shouldn't say finally because it actually was a pretty quick turnaround. So there was a while, a while ago, a comic book was announced. Uh, I have it here called truth, justice, American way. Um, Basically, this guy, Gabe El Taib, was working with someone else and announced this campaign is supposed to be very like kind of uh, sort of like traditional American superhero kind of thing. It was kind of spurred on by the idea that for a time, Marvel wouldn't let uh, the, they change the slogan of. Uh, well, no, sorry, it was Superman with DC it changed the slogan of of Superman. Um, to not include um, America or something like that. So he's going to make his own thing. And I thought the art looked amazing. Um, I liked the character designs and the concept. Um, but then it hit a snag. And I think the artist had like 
some health issues in the family and stuff and couldn't complete the artwork. Too bad. And um, so there were some, you know, like what's going to happen to the campaign exactly. You know, they weren't sure about it. There was some drama or whatever there. But Gabe decided that he was going to just start over and draw the whole book himself. So when it was going to be like, a, I think, a co-written thing with the other person lettering or uh, penciling it and Gabe coloring it, it's just going to be all Gabe. And so um, considering that, it's a pretty quick turnaround, uh, actually, you know, that I have this book. It's relatively sizable. Um, again, I like the character designs. Um, I, I like the setup. The general setup is that you have this team of heroes that, you know, is sacrificed a lot for the people in um, their city and everything, but kind of they get set up by some people and um, all of a sudden their returns against them. It's like kind of like a you know, social media thing. And all of a sudden these people, they, they haven't done enough for them and they're convinced that they've done all sorts of bad things. Um, I like that premise. Um, mm -hmm. Where I have to change, like change my tune now is um, the art is not what we were initially promised. Now I'm not saying that, you know, Circumstances are circumstances, so that's the way it is. But uh, and Gabe is a talented artist, but it is not what you know what was originally shown. Like definitely, the art sure. is uh, is is good by today's standards, but not uh, not great. That I think it was probably going sure. to be. Sure. Um, that's too bad. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, it's it's not where I think it's a, a unique concept and a pretty modern concept. It's not all that well um, fleshed out. Like I don't, um, it's, it's not reinventing the wheel. It kind of starts out with a sort of typical, the heroes are mid battle with a villain that's really sort of boisterous and ha ha, my name is this, you know, and I'm gonna do this and, you know, it kind of just, typical superhero kind of thing that is fine and it would be fine if you're like a kid reading it but as an adult it's like i i want more from it and then yeah. um a lot of the kind of they sort of try to i don't know add a lot of depth to our story and what had happened a kind of commentary in quickly in like the last couple pages as opposed to like you know we weren't we didn't have time again so i will give it it, it kind of wraps up it's a story that wraps up and so it, it has that it's not like just a tiny piece and then whatever but it's something that felt like it should have been more like we needed time with the characters and to care about them and to see the setup against them and to you know it was all just very fast and brief you know mm -hmm. so um yeah i don't know like am i gonna give it a score or something like that um i'm happy it came with some cards it came with some prints you know that's nice um mm -hmm. i uh i just was kind of expecting quite a bit from this and um ultimately what where it really matters in the story it just wasn't anything all that super engrossing so sure yeah, it's a, I mean, Sorry. it's a bummer when a project like this runs into snags, because um, then, of course, you feel like there could have been more potential focus on the story and improving that if, you know, the creator didn't have to be concerned with both elements. So. Yeah, and I'm guessing, because I think they share the property, something like that, I'm guessing the intent was to keep this going, working together. And then when that fell apart, it's like, well, I'm going to do this and then we're not going to do more of it then because we're done with the partnership or whatever. So it kind of had all like get wrapped up quickly and here it is. So that's what it feels like. Gotta, so. <sighs> so yeah, that's, those are my couple of reviews. I won't go into other things that I uh, did this week. Uh, it's a bunch of stuff, but uh, we'll get into some some news 
yeah. some new releases and all that sort of thing. You know, a lot of things are coming out of theater. We've mentioned some of them before. Um, we're going to be, uh, I'm hoping it gets to, to some of these other things. I don't know. I think maybe the thing I get to is Oppenheimer because both sure. Ashley and I want to see that one. And yeah. so maybe we'll, um, because it's, it's like, like yeah. Oh yeah, for absolutely. Yeah, and we heard that there's no CGI shots in the film. None. Oh, really? So okay. man, that's cool. That's cool. That is really cool. Especially in this and then, uh, day and age. <laughs> yes. Did you happen um, to watch the, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say like on that, um, I saw this on social media and like Chris and I were talking about it and I think it's hilarious. Um, so Oppenheimer and Barbie come out this week mm -hmm. on the same day. Um, and so apparently Friday is called Barbenheimer day and people mm -hmm. are just like making like whole elaborate plans to do like crazy opposite things and go see these movies because they are so like wildly different from each other. They're mm -hmm. like planning out entire days of like, okay, first I'm going to go to like brunch and do like bottomless mimosas and like, you know, go see Barbie. <laughs> and then I'm going to go to like a speakeasy and like, you know, go somewhere dark and like have a cigarette. And then I'm going to go watch Oppenheimer. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like yeah. people are just like planning yeah. these like wildly different, like smash together itineraries. Mm -hmm. And I think it's hilarious. Just like the stuff that people are coming up with to do. That's like themed diametrically opposite mm -hmm. trying to see these like wildly different films so yeah i've seen the poster fun, like wholesome trend i've seen the poster people have uh put together mm -hmm. that was good yeah. um i do think that uh it's it is a fun trend because we had this when doom eternal and animal crossing came out yeah we had this yep. crossover and so the people were drawing together Isabel and uh, Doom Slayer, and that was all fun. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I just I love this kind of stuff. This it just you know, when very fun, you know, lighthearted and, and um, but still like you know, creative things like take over social media. It's just like, ugh, this feels like more of you know, I don't know, the good old days or you know, sure. what social media is more meant for sometimes to just like share fun stuff like this. Sure. Um, did you happen to see the Napoleon trailer? So this is not coming out right now. I did. But you I did. did, okay. Yes. Yes. So. I was not aware of what I was watching at first. Mm. Um, like this, I just, I had no um, pre-warning of this movie. And, you know, I was watching a trailer without, like, guessing exactly what it was. And then, like, as we got into it, I was like, ah, okay. So... Joaquin Phoenix mm. is going to be playing Napoleon. Yes. <laughs> so. Yes. I think it's going to uh, be Ridley cool. Scott. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's an yep. Apple movie uh, produced mm -hmm. or whatever by Apple. And um, I don't know. How can you? Uh, Ridley Scott, Joaquin Phoenix, Napoleon. Yeah. Like, I, I'm on board. I hope it's a good one. I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, the last time Joaquin Phoenix uh was in a Ridley Scott movie. It's yeah. I mean, one of my top five all time movies. So how could yeah. this pairing go wrong? I mean, it, it, there's there's certain actors just say watch, you know, for Joaquin Phoenix, watch um her, Gladiator, and Joker. And it's like three completely different things, you know? Just the, the, to watch oh, like, watch someone's range is just you know, like, wow. I would I would throw in walk the line just because it's like that's so again wildly sure. different for mm -hmm. range. Like not every actor can like be a singer. It's an, yeah. I mean it's not like he carried that vocal solo, but like dang, that's that's hard to do. Yep, to be believable and yep. not look ridiculous. I thought it was so. fun because normally you're taking your star. And you're trying to make them look taller. You're casting everyone shorter than them. You're putting them on boxes, all stuff. And now we can do the exact opposite. I know. So I noticed that in shots. It's like, wow, he does look short. And I don't know what, how tall yep. Joaquin Phoenix is or anything like that. But, uh, you know. Uh, he's not short. Average height or something. You know, I don't know. Probably. He's like 6'1", yeah. Really? You think so? I'd be surprised. He is. 
Oh, oh. Uh, Alan's typing. Five eight. Oh, See, I know. Okay. Shut your face. I mean, five <laughs> eight isn't like you know, like terribly small, but it's it's under. No, the it's average. below average for yeah. Because five ten is the average for men. Um, depends on if we're talking worldwide or United States. Or the US. Um, yeah. I think United States is yeah five ten five eleven something like that. Man, people are people are gonna actually it's five nine. Like, I bet weird, like weird height obsessions because uh, we talked about this like two weeks ago when I was like talking about my or I mean a little bit longer than that I guess but I was talking about my dreams to be a jockey and how I was like too tall and then I was shocked that I was like average height. Oh, like, that's right. US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do remember blowing your mind with that that was fun yes i i really truly honestly was like what the hell okay united states um looks like five nine mm. okay, men, I was close. five I was three close. and a half for women so five, three and a half okay so i'm slightly taller than average Boop. yep Go you. Go me. Um, even even being held back by my scoliosis, which like crunched me down a couple inches. That's I'm right. Still yeah. Than the average. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Walking around with tall privilege there, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> MJ says five three here, so very you know about right there, pretty close yep. average. Yep, we're on par. Yeah. Um, okay. So be excited for that, everybody. I am. Um, I want to talk about the Dark Knight Rises. Sorry, sorry, just the Dark Knight, not the Dark Knight Rises. Um, <laughs> the Dark Knight. It came out 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I just watched that one. Um, it came out 15 years ago yesterday. So 2008. Um, that um, it makes sense, but it was surprising to me um alan's asking for spoilers i don't know like do we need spoiler warning for the dark knight 15 years i don't know if we're gonna get into well, it anyways didn't, but didn't, didn't we have this debate like, we did you know you know how many years are years throw it up there who you know yeah and so, i would yeah. say throw it up there just so like people can choose yep so I wanted to talk about this because I got, I read, I found this out because there was a great Twitter thread by someone uh, yes. that does a lot of movie related stuff and um, just a lot of good information about the film. So the Twitter page is called all the right movies and yep. um, it's a Make giant sense. 46 uh, part thread and a lot of great information there. And, I, they showed some of the promotional screens and stuff, and it really made me nostalgic, like I hadn't felt in a while, and in a number of ways. One, just this movie and the anticipation for it was, it was high. You know, the Batman Begins, well received. Um, the Dark Knight. I, there was a lot of like how are they going to do the Joker? How dare Heath Ledger be cast? Like, this is ridiculous. Oh, um, but there was such an excitement around this movie. And um, so much so that, like, I was asking, you know, I was like, pretty sure I saw this at the Minnesota app, IMAX, Minnesota Zoo IMAX, hmm. which I did. Yeah. <laughs> and my mom actually had made a scrapbook entry <laughs> for this, like, two page. The Dark Knight, the tickets and like pictures from it and like kind of quick review sort of thing or whatever. So, um, yeah. Um, and it, it made me like, you know, wow, this was a long time ago. Look how things have changed. But also made me think what an amazing time that first decade of the 2000s was for summer blockbuster movies. It just was kind of endless. And I'm envious for those times in the movies now. I mean, right now we have writers and actors on strike and we've had like dropping box office returns over and over. Like we have, we have movies that are just do not move the needle. Like people are not getting pumped and mass to go see these things. There's very few of them. Occasionally it happens, but for a while it was happening all the time. Lord of the Rings movie every year. 
Pirates of the Caribbean movie, a Dark Knight trilogy, um, the Spider-Man movies, the Harry Potter movies were still going. Like it just was like one after another after another. And like nerd culture hadn't gotten to the point where it was like everyone. So there's certain things that had to break through. You know, we were just really getting going on that uh, kind of thing. And I don't know. It just. But it was. It was. And it was fun. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It's and now I wish you could take it back, like put it back in the bottle, like let all the nerds be nerds and let the jocks be jocks or something like I, I almost wish it would go back the other way, because then only the people that really care about the thing would have their hands on the thing and sort of be like everybody else is their other own thing. And I don't know which way would be better, but I feel like we've definitely gone too far uh, the other way where it's just like. There's no meaning anymore, you know, yeah. their culture so and pop I, culture I mean, are the same thing. I I agree with you that like, like comic books and like what's traditionally been considered like nerd culture has been extremely overexploited. Um, and there's not a lot of like care and creativity, true creativity being put into a lot of products that's being put out. But I, I don't want to like take it back because, because it was such an exciting moment for somebody like who liked what was considered like nerdy things to mm -hmm. be able to just, like, you know, throw out a movie reference and have like anybody be like, oh my God, I saw it too. And you're like, yes, like, are yep. we so excited? So, so I wouldn't take it back, but I would in a sense, like stop the exploitation i guess mm -hmm. you know what i mean like it like i would i would say slow it down and like have some care but mm -hmm. this this particular time in which you know everybody was sort of like th the broader populace was discovering you know nerd culture was amazing it was amazing mm -hmm. to just like throw out something that you really loved and just know like i could talk about this with anybody because ev everybody's excited about it yep but they yeah, were excited no. about it because it was being done well. And mm -hmm. like, that's the difference. Nobody was just like pumping out like movie after movie after movie. People were taking their time with it. Communities. And is part of that for sure. Yes. It's one, of, it's one of the few movies that I remember being in the theater and not even like afterwards. I, I always think about this, like, you know, my friends wanted to talk about it. The group that I had gone with wanted to talk about it. I was like, I need a beat to just like still take Soak it, it in. in. It was so amazing. I just, I just need to like sit with it for a minute in my seat, mm -hmm. just like feeling it still because it was amazing. So, um, quick, uh, quickly say about the the culture things or whatever. You know, communities. I think in general are very welcoming and excited when people find a love for the thing they love and want to yeah. be a part of that. Where it, where we've gotten now is where people maybe were excited about one thing or a couple things or something in that community, but now are there and want to change it all. Like they're not, they're not really excited about the thing. It'd be like if you yeah. go to a knitting club because you, you know, it's like you t turn up and you're like, this is this is all great or whatever. You welcome all those people in. But if someone shows up and they want to like add cross stitch to knitting, they want to like, you know, you're, you're doing this wrong, guys. You got to do this. It's like now you're not so welcome. Like you didn't really like the thing that we liked. So find your own thing. And we're just to that point now where it's like it was, everything's made so mainstream or try to be changed for different, all kinds of different demographics and whatever. And it's just lost its soul of what made it its thing. And um, yeah. so, yes, I totally agree. Super exciting time. That's why I was so nostalgic about it. So missing that time. We just, yeah. we're not able to go back to that. And uh, part of that's sad, pretty sad. So Yeah, no, I, I totally, I mean, we're totally on the same page of like, you know, finding finding so much of the content a little bit soulless now because it's just so like formulaic and like churned out too rapidly to 
really take the time to like be true to what the story is, what a character is or whatever. Um, but there, there was definitely something exciting. I think about like the mainstream or like general population finding these things. So exciting while, while they were still being well done. Yep. You know, yep. there's just, there was something exciting about just like being able to go to anybody um, and, you know, talk about the thing that you loved because yeah, everybody was excited and interested in it. Or like Game of Thrones was one of those things when you know, yeah. first started, everybody was just like, oh my God, it's so amazing. And I was like, I read the books. I've known about this for years and like so pumped that I could just like go to work and talk to all my coworkers about it. Yeah. Um, Cause it's so mainstream. But then, yeah, obviously you have like things that just spiral out of control in their attempt to appe like appeal to the masses and you just sort of want to like shake people and be like, you were already appealing to the masses yeah. being true to the story. Like what, what did you need to change? So yep. yeah, I think that's the yep. point where I get frustrated is like people mm -hmm. change to appeal to the masses and like forget they were already doing that yep. by being, you know, amazing and original. Yep. Um, so in terms of the dark night, do you remember, like... <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, do you remember where you saw the movie and maybe how do you like know how many times you've seen it or at least the last time you've seen it? Yeah. So the last time I saw it was probably about a year ago. Okay. Um, and it was on, it was on TV and I was really excited about that. With commercials? Um, no. Okay. All right. It was not with commercials. Thank goodness. Um, that would be, I think, really tough with a movie like this where you just, it's yeah. so intense and visceral. Um, I did not watch it with commercials. Um, I, I remember the theater that I was in. I believe it was like the um, Oakdale Cinema 20 that's by my house. That's when I saw it for the first time. I think I saw it like three or four times in theaters just because okay. I felt like it was just really, it was probably like three. I want to four is probably one too many. I want I want to say three just because it felt so intense. Just, mm -hmm. it just felt like something that needed to be big. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, so being you watched it about a year ago, do you feel that it holds up? Like, is there anything that your perspective has changed at all or? Um, not overall. No. Okay. No, absolutely not. I think this is one of my, one of my favorite movies. Um, I've never really thought about like where it would rank in like, you know, is it my top five, top 10? Um, right. it's at least top 10, potentially a top five. If I, okay. if I really have to, like sit down and think seriously about it, this Oh, it's just so amazing. Top to Why bottom. so seriously, I Andrea? <laughs> I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, uh, okay. Yeah, I, if I really had to think about it, like the acting from everybody just feels like top level. The storyline is written well, like just the premise of it. It's, it's to me the rare sequel that's better than the original. Okay. Or the initial in a trilogy, whatever. whatever mm -hmm. you, I'm not thinking of the right word, but it's yeah, the rare it's, sequel better. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I um, I think it's no doubt the best in the Dark Knight trilogy, um, easily. Um, I my only complaints with the movie, and I don't remember feeling this at the time when I initially watched it, but over the years, um, one, well, I guess this first one I had to complain about, I did not like the recasting of Rachel Dawes. Um, Maggie Gyllenhaal, I was not a fan of her portrayal. Um, we she did well before How what's it's that really hard us we talked about our issues with recasting before how it's really hard for us to like mm -hmm. switch even if you know in this case maggie gyllenhaal like is a great actress and she did a really good job it's just really hard to like yeah 
the emotional scenes were well handled. She did that well. Um, I think that's no where it sings. Like Bale, what what's that? I don't feel like there's like a great connection with Christian Bale though. I don't feel that no. chemistry. Nope. It, it feels, it feels too standoffish. I'm not, you know, as opposed to, I don't buy him like still being suggesting, Hey, I might be done as Batman soon. Maybe that day's coming, you know, you want to come away with me that I just didn't feel that. Um, she wasn't, a, she was, that I'm willing to like look past it, but you are very right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just like, it, her emotional goodbye is oof. yes yes exactly well that's done. where it redeems itself um yeah and i don't know that uh katie holmes i mean i can't say i don't sure, know I yeah do, yeah because that was on point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then um okay i guess there's three things the second thing is um I do have an issue with some of the dialogue slash delivery. Um, I found this at like a couple moments, maybe in Batman Begins and then in The Dark Knight. And then I feel like as a director, maybe Nolan got better and it wasn't the case in The Dark Knight Rises. So I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. It's kind of throughout the film. There's these moments where it feels like maybe people are talking past each other and the conversation doesn't feel natural. So um, there's a situation where um, the, the money is gone. They're going to, are going to take all this money from the mob bosses. They found all the banks that the vaults that they're in. And when they go, all the police go in, hit the places all at once, it's gone. And they're like, okay, someone snitched. And they're on the roof with the bat signal. Batman's up there, Gordon and Dent and Batman. And Dent and Gordon are arguing. Um, and I mean, Gary Oldman, amazing actor. So I'm like, it's not, but still in the moment, they're kind of talking at each other about the corruption. You know, like your people are corrupt, your people are corrupt. And there's nothing wrong with what is happening in this scene. It is the delivery and the way that, again, it feels like they're saying the line because this is what has to be. It's kind of like if if I'm talking and you're supposed to cut me off in the middle of a rant in a scene, but I know it's coming and stop. You know, you didn't actually cut me off. Sure. It's that kind of thing. It didn't, it just doesn't flow naturally. And I feel like there's a number of moments where it's like the line is being said, the line technically makes sense, but it's being said in a way that it's like, it doesn't feel normal. I it know, feels I like you have to tell me this thing. So, yeah, sure. Like I know I will stop in the middle of this sentence. So I don't have to think about how it ends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just a few delivery yeah. issues I have. And it's, it again, it's not, sure. You know, it's it's a quibble, but uh, sure. nonetheless. Yeah, I mean that one's that one's harder for me because you know I saw it a year ago, so I I don't necessarily remember that mm -hmm. to that detail, um, or or maybe perhaps like I just you know sort of went with it, but I, yep. yeah. Yep. Um, and then the last thing that I can think of is okay. <laughs> There's four things. I'm going to, these are going to be a shorter. These are my, these are all my complaints. So the, uh, the other one is Christian Bill's voice as the Batman. And in that movie what? thread, yes, a Twitter thread, which yeah. blew my mind, right? We're yes. going to say the same thing. Yes. Christopher Nolan in post changed Christian Bill's voice because he did the performance like he did in Batman Begins. And in this one, he changed it to make it more gravelly and rough. And I yeah. would be pissed if I was Christian Bale. I would be yeah, so pissed. Had so much shit for that. So much you shit. All so the memes. Much shit. I kind of want to source on this because I've never heard yeah. this before, and I, that just would be make me so mad. So, um, do you think? Do you think Christian Bale somewhere is just like, yeah, like <laughs> justice? <laughs> yeah, it finally was. It was said. Someone, probably, right? yeah, right. <laughs> But I mean, good on him for not just being like, it was Nolan and like finger pointing. Yeah, this right. Is true. He it didn't. Is true. Good on him for not just being like pointing the blame, you know, somewhere yes. else and like playing that game, but just being, you know, 
waiting it out, biding his time, like riding it out. And then, you know, if this is true, I'm sure it's just, oh, feels good. Yep. It's not me. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, and is, my last thing that is, is one of the most ridiculed things, of course. Yes. Uh, the last thing is the waste of Two Face. I thought the casting of Two Face was pretty good. I was liking yeah. the way they set up Two Face and everything. And it, to me, it seemed obvious that we that the movie should have waited and kept never taken Harvey Dent out of the hospital, or he just got out, but we didn't even see the transformation to Two Face. And that with Two Face would be the villain in the third one. Seemed obvious. Mm. Leave Two Face mm. to be the villain in the third one. But they go ahead and kill him right away. It's just a, a massive waste of this Batman villain. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, because I surprised liked Dark Knight Rises. I okay. went into that one like with a lot of reservations, especially about Anne Hathaway as Catwoman. Um, okay. I'll not lie to you. I was I was just like pump those brakes who did this casting and she okay. pleasantly surprised me um mm -hmm. and i mean I'll, I'll be stronger than that i actually really liked her take on it um do i think it's the best Catwoman? no but but it was like light years beyond what i had feared um so i i really like the dark knight rises i think there's so many great things about that premise and i don't know you know, how to get to a movie where, like, Dent is the main villain um, or, you know, he's in The Dark Knight Rises or, like, you know. So, yes, I agree that it's a waste, but I don't know where we would go with Harvey Dent either. You know um, what I mean? Yeah, well, we never, so we never we got to see. Just, like, abandoned him? Uh I, I know it's kind of an and, interesting and idea, or something, but I don't know. I don't know what he would do I, in there. I, I know it's an Where interesting idea in that a, they in take. A takeover of Gotham. Well, he maybe be the new guy running the streets, the, you know, the, the crime syndicates in the street. He'd be the one that really like, he's the one that puts so many of these people away, you know, that, um, you know, it's I just, really it's just a movie. Well, but see, Bane could still come in and be, Bane could be the one that ends it. And so again, for some, he's seen as a savior. He, for some, he's the one that is like doing the thing Batman can't do. You know, he yeah. could be the one to kill Two-Face, could do it publicly. And then I'm giving the city back to the people. That's the whole purpose of Bane. And he says, it like, you know, like here we're, we're turning the power and the city to you. And when yeah. it's been overrun by the very person that you were trusting before to lock everybody up is now using those people to run amok in the city. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that premise. I just feel like it would take so long to set. It would take too long to set up. Because Harvey, I mean, yes, Harvey Dent was like the savior of Gotham at one point, And then like he becomes two face and we never really get to see him become like the villain. And that's, I don't know. I, I always love like Gordon's like torture dilemma about like, what do we do about this? Right. And we just like pretend he's, you know, so good. And Gary Oldman's so good at it. Um, just like this torturous, like I'm hiding the truth and I feel dirty and I hate it. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's, that's a lot of fun for me to see him play as an actor, but it would take a while to set up Dent as like a villain, like running the streets and, and to like see that, you know, switch in Gotham and in the normal citizenry that, I mean, the Dark Knight Rises is also is already a pretty long movie. And then to like add this in, I don't know. Well, they would, they would have to, they would have to cut down. So my, my thoughts of initially of wasting Harvey Dent and Two-Face and all this stuff. And I'm, I'm not my, disagreeing with you about wasting Harvey Dent. I just like, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how he fits in. I mean, all that was like formulated before the Dark Knight Rises, before we knew there was Bane or anything like that. So like, it, yeah, if we try to fit in Two-Face, 
into the Dark Knight Rises or make him work with Bane, it does become a more difficult endeavor than like, well, okay, if we're if we didn't do that, I and mean, the whole time we were planning to have Harvey Dent and Two Face, where does how does that shape our story? Because I think where the Dark Knight Rises gets messed up is that they're trying to bring the League of Shadows back in. The whole idea that we're tying this trilogy together because we have League of Shadows and Talia al Ghul and all stuff, that doesn't make that doesn't work. It adds a complication that doesn't need to be there. It's not satisfying. It's not like what would you imagine it's supposed to be a satisfying? I don't think it's a satisfying. Oh, it's actually still the League of Shadows. Like I was content with their destruction and Batman Begins. Um, and Bane is no one's puppet. Like it was, it was a fundamental issue with the development of Bane that he's like the puppet of the League of Shadows because he's like in love with this one woman from it. Like it's just not the character of Bane. And so I like a lot about Dark Knight Rises, especially I just watched it again. Um, mm -hmm. There are some improvements in there and some of that. I generally do actually like, I like Tom Hardy's performance with for the Bane that they did go with. I do agree that I like Anne Hathaway as Catwoman, mm -hmm. but the movie also, I don't think really fit to have Catwoman. Like, I don't think that there was room for her in this movie, really. Like, she felt underutilized too at times, just as like a means I to like, guess. you know, I just, I, I like, I, I like don't know the that I love. Her, um, you know, being this like agent of chaos and like thinking, you know, like all these things are going to work out and then having them realized and being like it, it sort of being an epitome of be careful what you wish for and sure. her having these like regrets sure. about that. That was an interesting angle for her. I thought mm -hmm. I liked her look, you know, I like, I thought but they yes, did a good job. A the suit was nice. The clothing they had her wear was nice. Um, so like, I'm, yeah, I'm, I don't come down as hard on this version of Catwoman as I think other people do maybe. Um, but yeah, the movie got too long and convoluted and then Wielding. adding in the like adding in the whole new detective that was played by Gordon Lovett, you know, who is mm -hmm. like weirdly going to be Robin Nightwing kind Robin of setup. Maybe. Yeah, but but his name movie, is not Dick Grayson too, much. too yeah. much. And then they leave him like the keys to the Batcave and like. But like, what why? is this? This is yeah. Who is it? You know, like, I I didn't like any of that. There's no like real real rapport built with Christian Bale. Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, and it, just yeah. some guy. Here you go. You know, back cave. Who like critiques um, like, oh, I was part of like you know, the Wayne Foundation, and like, why did you yeah. stop? You know. Yeah. I mean, it it all like ties together and it all wraps up and it's fine. It's just not like. You didn't take enough time with everything. Yep. The Dark Knight yep. Rises gets a little big for itself. Like it just tries yes. to spin too many directions, too many plates. Like, yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting. Christian Bale does the the Daniel Craig of the Batman era because Daniel Craig takes us from the beginning in Bond, early oh, Bond yeah. to conclusion. And so we have that with Christian Bale's Batman too, then is yeah, we have the start of Batman to like middle Batman to always the end Batman. Batman so, yeah. Yeah. Yep. To I'm so, dead slash retired. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was a, that was a great moment. He's like, whatever you believe. With, well, well, um, um, Alfred Sam, you know, does he though? Or does he just like wish he does? That's there's no what is the evidence for that? What is the evidence for that? <laughs> I mean, nothing, but like, yeah, no, nothing. But you know what I mean? Like, there's there's just enough like tinge no. of wishful thinking that I think there's there's merit for people who want to say like. This is Alfred just like. Satisfyingly dreaming this. Nope. Meritless. No merit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, okay. Well, yeah, that's the Dark Knight. A little bit about Dark Knight Rises. 
Dark Knight came out 15 years ago yesterday. Amazing um, movie. Amazing movie. Tons we didn't talk about it. Uh, tons of things we didn't talk about the movie that you know are standout things and whatever, but it's definitely a movie that made a lasting impact. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I miss the days. Um, we're running kind of long, so do you mind if we like skip these other things here? Let's do it. Okay. All right. Um, we got to talk about Mission Impossible. So we do There's so much to the, talk about. The first six Mission Impossible movies. I'm not going to go through like every movie exactly no. in like in fine detail, yeah. but like we want to, we got to talk about what this franchise has meant and how this has been. And I want to show off a couple things as we start um, for, to sh kind of show you what like mission impossible has meant to me. I'm wearing a, a watch today that mm -hmm. um, was the second watch, no, the third watch I remember getting. So, um, I don't wear my Apple watch much these days anymore. I uh, kind of back into wearing regular watches because like they have soul. Uh, we're talking about things being soulless and like the Apple watch is incredibly useful, but it's also kind of soulless. And what I notice with all my watches is they all have a memory tied to them. Like I have the watch now that I wore when my kids were born and I will remember that I have that wore that watch then. Um, That's really cool. It won't just be like Apple Watch six, whatever, you know, whatever number it was in that. So um always have that. And um, but this watch, this is a Casio G Shock watch. And in Mission Impossible 2, there's a very crucial moment. A couple of crucial moments in these movies where watches are used. And um there's a timer that has to be set before uh, uh Naya is dead before she can't be helped anymore and so mm -hmm. there's a close-up of the watch this is not that watch but i was a kid and in the store and i was i liked that watch uh, from the movie and i found this one that i thought looked very similar and so mm -hmm. it's the same brand it's the same it's a g-shock also as in the movie so it's the same like line of casio watches um, and similar dials and layouts and stuff, but slightly different. So in mine, the second hand, the seconds countdown in a horizontal digital bar and in the watch in the movie, they count in the circle. Mine has the bar yeah. and the circle, but they, they do different things. So anyways, I bought this watch right away on my little kid wrist. It didn't fit very well, but, uh, I wore it anyways. And uh, I've had it all these years. <laughs> What's that? I was gonna say, but that didn't matter because, like, you had the yeah. like the closest thing. Yeah, you know, back in the day, it was diff more difficult to find out what exactly what model it was. Now I can look up online, find the exact model, could get that thing. But this was like me just seeing on screen, getting the closest thing I could find, and uh, that's what it is. One other thing. Um, so I do actually, I'm gonna brought my watch box and I actually um, have this watch. For those that are watching, well, it's, that's is on a black background. Um, this one here. So this is also a Casio, but this is the actual watch, not like the actual one in the move from them, but the same model as from the movie and from the first movie. So in the very first movie, Tom Cruise is wearing this Casio watch. It is like basically a G-Shock watch without the like the branding and certification or whatever but it's a very sort of like um uh if it will focus very sort of blade runner looking watch it's got interesting yeah. colors to it and stuff like that uh, very unique sort of shape to it I'm taking off the black background so we would see it a little bit better if you're watching it but um yeah so i got this watch and um yeah, Alan shared in the chat, DW290. It's a very affordable watch. It's a comfortable watch. So if anyone wants a little piece of movie memorabilia, while they still make them, you can go ahead and pick up one of these Casio uh, DW290 watches anywhere. And uh, yeah, so there's my Mission Impossible watches. Um, That's fun. fun. Show and tell. So, um, Anyways, 
the movies. Oh, Alan says here in MI2 it was the DW6900. So okay, for those of you okay. out there looking. I'll find other excuses to bring out my watch collection. Um, it's good. <laughs> there are plenty of other, I mean, there's plenty of Bond films that center around watches. Yes, being, well. Like, pivotal for, you know. I do uh, not. Bond's bag of tricks and explosives and setting things. I mean. I will not be dropping. Is about, you know, timing on watches for James Bond. Um, which one? Timing well, up. I mean, one of them is a is just a timer. Like Golden Eye is obviously okay. Okay, like, that's what I thought you were going. Fenty about like you set the timers for three minutes instead of six. Mm -hmm. Right, but there's like other moments in that film where they they like definitely use watches to like set timers for things. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the one of the God, one of the really pivotal moments I'm thinking of is also a Pierce Brosnan. Is it Tomorrow Never Dies or is it Die Another Day? There's like a really pivotal scene with a watch timer. Hmm. In, in, in Goldeneye, the watch nothing. is a grappling hook. Yep. In Tomorrow Never Dies... Uh, well, let's see. I know Brosnan uses one a laser on in one of the movies. He uses the watch laser. Yeah. Yep. Um. But I, I don't There's know. There's another one where it's like a watch pin does something. Oh God. Watch All pin. Right. Okay. Anyway. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um. This is my closest Bond watch. Um. This is this is I, I am not spending three thousand dollars on an Omega watch. Um, or some of the other ones. So this is this is just a Casio, but it is definitely designed after. It's a diver watch, and um, the band is a NATO band that is designed after one from um, uh, No Time to Die. So it's my okay. this is my Bond watch. Um, yeah. Um, all right, Mission Impossible. Um. <laughs> Mission Impossible has lots of watches in it too, but um, so have you? Did you watch all these movies basically as they came out? Have you always been a fan? Um, what's the series meant to you, or is like is it something you've come to later or piece it together and stuff over time? Or yeah, so I mean, I I came to the series a little bit later, um, but I had watched. Once, once I saw the first Mission Impossible, I really liked it a lot. So I had watched and gone to like theatrical releases through four. And I realized I did not go to theatrical release for five or six. But I was interested in them coming out and had watched them. Okay. So I, re yeah. I really liked Mission Impossible. I, I really remember liking the first one um and the third the second okay. one i had trouble with then and now on rewatch okay. <laughs> um ghost protocol was really fun i remember and it was fun to see in the theaters but i was let down um i feel like not not especially by the premise but like paula Patton is so bland and just nothing oh as like the okay. female lead to me okay anyway okay i just i got really bored with it okay and it kind of like made my love for mission impossible take a brief dip interesting even though i really loved um the addition of jeremy renner and his storyline in relation to um, Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt. Um, I really liked that aspect of it, but I just, I kind of like took a dip with four. I think because I was coming off of like MI3 and Philip Seymour Hoffman being such like an awesome villain and four feels just like there, it's not like a focused villain. Okay. It's hard. It's hard sure. to like get into that one. Okay. 
Um, were there any movies, you, any of them that you watched, you know, the, your impression from when you first saw them to this viewing now that dramatically changed? Um, I liked five better on a rewatch, even though I think there's like the most amount of problems that I still have with it. Oh, interesting. But okay. I, I felt like, like the cast gelled more and I felt like, it picked me back up after Ghost Protocol in a like, I like the spirit of Mission Impossible still way, even if I'm finding the nuanced logistics of a storyline hard to swallow. Okay. So yeah, what are what are your what do you find your problems are with with five? Like what are some of the issues? Right that... right smack dab in the opening scene where like Jeremy Renner is testifying before Congress about like the necessity of the IMF and like Alec Baldwin is like, I'm the head of the CIA and we should take you over. And it's like, what? And like Ethan Hunt is off on this like crazy hunt for like the syndicate. And it's like, where, where was any of this? There's no like mm. background for any of it, but they're like acting like it's established. Like, the CIA has always been angry with like the IMF and their license to operate as they will. Um, and like Ethan Hunt's always been like, there's like this shadow organization. And so like, logically, I really had a hard time being like, mm. why are you acting like I should know about this when it's being introduced right now? And so it does make the trick reveal at the end a little more palatable but as a viewer, just like being shot into it at the beginning, it's it's very hard to swallow as the setup. Interesting. Yeah, for me. Um, for me. Yeah. Um, five was the one that I, I kind of over the years gotten pieces of four and five mixed up. Shows you have not watching sure. them enough. And I remember thinking five was kind of a dip. And I was telling people that I was like, yeah, five, that one's not quite as good. Rogue Nation, you know, and um, Rome Pondery watching is like, oh, I had some of these mixed up and I love Rogue Nation. I thought that um, I that's the one film in the rewatch that I dramatically changed my opinion of other than like the thing I was confusing with was some stuff from Ghost Protocol and Ghost Protocol. Oh. I rem remember really liking in the theater and then later like, having more yeah more it really comes down to the ending the ending fell flat for me the oh, kind of hobbling God, through yeah. a car garage thing was not really the you know yes uh yeah that didn't that didn't it, it didn't wrap up well for me in that way yeah um paula Patton, i didn't angry. necessarily have an issue with but i think she is one of the weaker i suppose female leads if we are going to compare her it is. Um, Rogue Nation, though, I think so. I was listening to a podcast by the director, uh, McQuarrie, um, and he was doing a long interview. I didn't get through the whole thing, but they said one of the one of the things that there aren't a lot of necessities, they say, in making a Mission Impossible movie, but there are certain things that Tom really wants to be there. And one of those, the, when he was when he was looking back through the films, is always that every one of them you're launched into it something immediately that you're in the middle of and you don't know what's happening and it might or might not be implemented and make sense later um, mm -hmm. with what it is, but you're always like in the middle of a mission or something to get you going. It's the excitement. And then we, then we get handed the mission should you choose to accept it and the rest of the plot. And so um, yeah. it was interesting for Rogue Nation to start off with such a massive stunt it's like oh plain you know um so i thought that was uh that was cool um the yeah. uh, like other thing I, otherwise I, like oh god i just i just feel like i mean i agree with you like rogue nation starting off with like the plane stunt was pretty cool even though i tend to gravitate towards like the simpler stunts as some of my mm. favorite moments even though so rogue nation has one of my favorites that i'm most impressed by which is like literally tom cruise like like upper bodying up a steel pole that is insanely mm. hard to do that is it's one of my favorites it's just because it's so like sheer like 
physicality. Yep. And it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's almost no show showmanship, but it's the most impressive because so many yep. people would not be able to do that. Yep. Um, but so, yeah, so I like the, the initial stunt of rogue nation, but like I said, the, the jump into like the IMF before Congress and this sort of like assumption that we need to have that the CIA has always been pissy at IMF when we haven't seen that before. And like Tom Cruise is chasing the syndicate. We haven't seen that before. I would have preferred for those things, even to just like be Easter egged in other films, just so mm. I could be like, sure. Like I buy this. And it, it doesn't help for me that like, I think Alec Baldwin's performance as like this, the head of the CIA is particularly weak. Um, mm. I, I really like him in six where he's like kind of having fun now that he's part of the IMF and he's like a little bit more enjoyable, but like that whole opening between him and Jeremy Renner and their supposed like contention, it just, it always just felt like, mm, I'm not, I'm not in this. Okay. I'm not sold. I, I'm trying to remember. I thought, and maybe I'm completely wrong. I thought there was supposedly some little Easter egg about syndicate before, but yeah, that generally that one is like a new thing, you know, that Tom's out. And I didn't think of that as like, Tom has been after this for years, like since no, the beginning, in like, just in like in the right, last the few first, months, he's really been. Is, yeah. Mm -hmm. The first mission Impossible is so self-contained that it works really well on its own. And then like, Really, I would expect like maybe two or three to have like an Easter egg and continue something in four to so I can get to five. So I'm not saying like right from the very beginning, but I just I needed like a mm -hmm. little. The contention with the IMF that worked for me because if we look at it, there's just always issues either with or within the organization. So in three. You know, we have that um, uh, you've got a traitor inside and you've got Lawrence Fishburne coming in and like laying down the hammer, bring Ethan in, you know, he's the suspect. Yeah. You're like a loose cannon here. So again, his record is piling up. Um, in four, um, the head of the IMF is assassinated. The head of the IMF yeah. is assassinated. Everyone's disavowed. You, they're going to a remote train car for to pick up their gear. Mm -hmm. You know, like this is all we've got. Yeah. You know, in five, um, yeah, it's it's one of those things where you know we're talking now about like also the British government not being upfront and yeah. um, you know so yeah it makes sense like hey you've got. Look at all this chaos that's been in your wake, IMF. Like you're going without oversight here. We can't possibly have this. To me, that sort of thing rings true. It talks about modern, uh, you know, issues uh, in a sense. And um, if anything, it's like this time. I would expect that coming sooner. Um, I so, do think that they went, they hit a tone, and maybe that's where party issues. Like I say, with the performance, of Alec Baldwin, there's a sort of a. a tongue in cheek, almost tone to some of the banter and stuff that makes it feel less impactful or like there's real stakes mm -hmm. there or something. So, so definitely to your point about like the IMF having problems like that, that is one of my broad notes, like on a rewatch, on, like a binge of all these movies. Like I was just like, IMF, you need to check yourselves because everybody's getting betrayed all the time. Like right from movie one, we have an agent betrayal. MI2 um, is another agent betrayal. Um, three, three, I guess, isn't an agent betrayal. Um, but four, like the whole, well, the whole IMF is like, you know, the secretary gets killed and then like the whole IMF like gets shut down. Mm -hmm. I have like the IMF is in trouble because you know, all this shit went down and they're like IMF gets absorbed by the CIA. Like so, so much betrayal all the time. Um, so yes, yes. In that sense, I felt that the, the congressional 
inquiry was like believable, but I just didn't feel like why the CIA was the one being like, the IMF is terrible. Like mm. there was no history with the CIA. There was no like, sure. we've always been contentious with this organization. If it was like a Senator mm. or like a Congressman or, or whoever sure. who was like, you know, we need to have this, this organization have oversight. That's that's like riddled throughout like millions of spy movies. So I would have swallowed yeah. that more than I would have swallowed like the CIA aspect. Sure. Oh so yeah. Yeah. That that was my issue. Um, and then the syndicate ended up being like one of my favorite like twisty reveals where like the prime minister of Britain is like, Yes, I know you didn't do this thing that you yeah. told me was theoretical. And like that whole scene is just like mm. So good. One of my favorites. Yep. But the beginning of it was very just like abrupt. And so I was just having a lot of trouble with that at the beginning of the movie. And that's that's what's Mission Impossible is about kind of scenes like that where it's like, you know, it's you, you're like, how are you getting worked into this corner? And then it was the plan all along. Mask comes oh, off, you know? Yeah. 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 Like how many times oh, okay. can you like, successfully surprise us with that because you can't overuse it and it's just like right? it's very well done in this Mission moment. Impossible does do that very well yeah no mm -hmm. I agree mm -hmm. um I okay I'm gonna take the time to defend Mission Impossible 2 so everybody is uh generally doesn't like Mission Impossible 2 that is fine um I would say if I was ranking the movies it would be towards the lower end of my list um but Agreed. Um, I actually really enjoy it for what it is. I think that the first, if you look at the first four movies, mm -hmm. all of them f share something that's mission impossible. Like they share Tom Cruise and a team taking on an impossible mission, lots of stunts and gadgets. Um, but they're all like very different visions by different directors. And like dramatically so at times. And number two by John Woo is a perfect example of that dramatically different take and style from the rest of the films. And I actually like it. And I think there's some things that aren't done well, but Tandy Newton in there, I think is really good. Definitely had a crush on her at the time when watching that movie that probably helped, but she's, um, there's like a good emotionality that I kind of buy between Tom Cruise and her in that movie. And the score, along with the moments when she chooses to sacrifice herself, I get chills every, I get chills just thinking about that. So like when it's like, pick up the thing, the music, it's a little slow-mo, like the music, like, you know, like she's like looking at him and then she injects herself. It's like, holy shit. And it's like, you know, you can't kill this dumb bitch because she's worth however much million dollars. It's like. It's perfect. Tom Cruise panic trying to get her out. Like, I think there's a lot of good drama in that movie. And I also think the plot's incredibly believable. It's just like, it's a thing that as a kid, I would, you know, it's kind of scoff at or something like that. But now it's like, I'm down for this plot. And uh, I think that, you know, the music's good. We get a Metallica song that's in there. Mm -hmm. um, there's just a lot to like about it. And it's, it's indulgent. It's like, it is very much like, you know, Tom Cruise is doing flips and stunts for no purpose like it is completely yeah. no There's reason to do no a over the you know a 360 flip to yeah. heel kick you know axe kick someone ridiculous i don't need yeah. to like front wheelie on my motorcycle to flip it around to like shoot the car it's like it's ridiculous but it is what the film is is it's not it all feels intentional. And once you see this is the kind of film it is, it belongs. Does it stand out from the others? Because the others aren't like that and don't do that? Yes. But I think that for what the film is and what it's trying to be and what John Woo would be bringing to this film, I think it does exactly. Plus, Anthony Hopkins is the guy in there in this one. I like how they change directors yeah. and like Anthony Hopkins is in there, even though it's short. So yeah. that's my defense of Mission Impossible 2. I mean, any any um, leader of IMF feels like they have a short tenure. And I mean, yes, <laughs> that 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 works for me. That's whatever, um, mm -hmm. you know, and like you said, Anthony Hopkins is really fun, even though like he's incredibly casual 
about yes. like her agent just being like, hey, like gonna be a terrorist now. <laughs> <laughs> like, yep. like he's so casual about the fact that like this former agent, Sean Ambrose, um, is like, hey, he's even doubled you, which I do find really fun. Like this is the only movie where we've seen like an Ethan double. Yeah. I do yep. find that very fun, even if I like anticipated where it was going all the time. Like the the very first reveal of like him on the plane. On the plane. With, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's always like a, a good like, oh God. The first time I saw that, I didn't see that coming. And then like, even though I saw it coming on a rewatch, I was still like, oh, it's so good though. They do it yep. so well. Um, but like the second one where he's talking to Naya. And you're just like, oh, girl, that's not Ethan. Right. That's not Ethan, you're so F but right now. It's all but worth it's it so when fun. he pulls off the mask and is like just it's enraged so and sad great. and like, yeah. yes. It's so fun because because that's the only movie where we see that, where we see mm -hmm. Ethan doubled. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's like a great use of that. And mm -hmm. a great like practical consideration of like, it, it you can't just like do anybody. You know what I mean? Like, right. it, yes. There are some times when the movies act like you can just like throw on a mask and like, you know, you can just be somebody else. And it's like, no, you kind of have to like be like a general a little like them. type. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's kind of a fun practical acknowledgement. Um, but yeah, I, I do have a lot of problems with two. It is a lot different than one. And I think that's a product of it being like almost, it's almost a different era of movies from the time one yes. is made to the time two is made. And it's two is good when you think of where it is chronologically in the era of movie making, but it is hard to make the jump from one to two mm -hmm. in terms of like all the extras two has in terms of like being extra. And it's extra jarring like an because like one said, an indulgence. Yes. One is actually a movie of a different era than it's from. Like it's a movie really of the heart of a couple decades earlier, you know. So uh the palm this De Palma film, yeah, it's goes from it skips 30 years in style, yep. basically. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So. So yeah, when you watch them too close together and you don't like think about that, it is really hard to make the jump from one mm -hmm. to two than mm -hmm. it is from like any other one singular film in the franchise to another. Yep. Three, for whatever reason, I didn't like when I saw it in the theater. I think I was focused on other things. I was crazy because when I saw it after the fact, again, it's kind of like me with Casino Royale, really. I'm like, this movie is J.J. Abrams' best movie. It is nonstop. So it is so intense. Philip Seymour Hoffman is amazing. I like the group they have assembled. It's just, it's very good. It's just, mm -hmm. it's by the books, good action spy movie. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, and then in the later films, they really started to become, you know, stunt porn. You know, I, listening to the uh, to the interview with the director, uh, McQuarrie, he's like, anytime someone brings up an idea for a stunt to Tom, this first thing is, okay, well, how can they know it's me? Because you can't just do a thing where you can put a helmet on, because it could then it might as well just be some anyone. It's like yeah. they ha it has to be able to know it's me, and so. I, ha I do have to say, I brought it up with anime before where there's like a visceral, emotional, like physical thing that I get watching some anime. Some of these Mission Impossible movies do that to me too. Because you know the stunts are real. Um, some of like the motorcycle chase in the last two, in the last two um, is just you know, thrilling. The helicopter stuff at the end of six you know, yeah. is just nuts. The camera stuff, it, it, it just is really well done. And I really appreciate the, uh, like the authenticity of it. Like we're going to put this in camera. We're going to have it happen. There are people are going to do it. Um, I love when Tom gets other people to kind of have his same mentality. 
like I guess Rebecca Ferguson, he kind of encouraged and she just like launched in to doing like, I'm going to learn to ride a motorcycle. I'm going to do this. I'm going to hold my breath for super long. We're going to be in the water, like totally on board. And it makes her like, she is one of the, in my opinion, one of the best additions to the franchise. She is like, just, she is super hot. She is super believable. She is super competent. She is super just like, she does everything right. And I think she's a, she's got a, a multifaceted story. It's cool where she came from, like trying to get out of the service, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's uh yeah. My only qualm is her name. I'm not, you know, like Ilsa is not, no, it doesn't fit her. Does it like, it's not, I, it's not the name per se. I just don't look at her and think her name is Ilsa Faust. It's too- maybe not the last name. I'm okay with the first name. You know, it's she's too, I don't know. Like Ethan Hunt is very like normal and bland without, without being just like John Smith. You know what I right. mean? Like it's normalized mm-hmm. enough that it just feels like that's your name. Her name is almost too unique for her, even though she's a bomb character, she needs a more normal name. Sure. I know what you mean. It's like someone trying to come up with, well, we need a unique name, you know, like let's come up with a unique name. That's, that's different. And then it's too, it just doesn't, fit doesn't her. feel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. It doesn't feel like that's her actual name. That is my, yeah. my only quibble. Her performance is amazing. Like you said, I love the addition of her character. I love like her grounded believability. Um, her entire performance I mean, I liked her in Rogue Nation a lot, like from the inception of, you know, us meeting her, but I love her performance in Fallout um, that upon a rewatch, I forgot how much I love that movie. So I, I mean, I just mm-hmm. really loved her character, but yeah, every time somebody calls for Ilsa, I'm just like, stop it, stop it. That's not her name. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I did think Fallout uh, you know, 6 got a little... A little longer than it needed to be a little in the weeds with some of the you know like between the broker and who's betraying who and i honestly don't know that i super believed henry cavill as the mastermind guy that wanted to like he's gonna spread smallpox and he was in charge here and stuff like i just don't know that that really worked for me i i agree with you um i didn't i didn't believe him like you said, kind of overarching that way, even though I really enjoyed the exchange where I knew Benji was impersonating Solomon Lane. Mm, Yeah. And like everybody was like setting it all up and like everybody was just like having fun and Alec Baldwin's like, oh, you're right. This is fun. Like like, everybody was just like doing their classic thing. Like we're using masks, we're trapping somebody, we're setting them up somebody's on the phone listening like it was all like just super fun um and you know as he's admitting like oh i didn't write the manifesto to be like that and you're just like oh, dig it deeper like i know they're catching you <laughs> so um the, like it was all like really fun but yes i don't know that like standing back and being like is he like the deep villain no <laughs> yep it's still, it's um, still for me is Solomon Lane, Sean Harris. He is, he is my, my non-obvious Philip Seymour Hoffman villain fave. Okay, yeah. Um, I think every, I think IMF is playing chess. Everyone else is playing checkers. It's, uh, it's that kind of thing. So they're underest, you know, they're underestimating what uh, the IMF is up to here and. And Solomon Lane, yeah, I agree. I, Solomon Lane is really great. I liked him a lot more in Rogue Nation than I did, though, in um, Fallout, for some reason. Just, I don't know. Um, if it was the look, for some reason. I don't know, just it worked for him being the, yeah. the one, the step ahead, you know, in Rogue yeah. Nation. With and glasses having, cleaned up. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then in Fallout, it felt like he wasn't, he didn't feel the threat that he was and you know like in mission impossible three when they're gonna break out philip seymour hoffman's character i'm like oh shit 
oh no, you cannot, you feel, you feel Ethan Hunt's panic. You, we cannot let this guy out. This guy is the one that, you know, he'll find everything. Like his threats are so good. His calm composure when Ethan Hunt loses it is so good. Like mm -hmm. he gets pulled back into the plane and he notices that he mentioned a name or whatever. And he's going to remember that. Like he's a, he's yeah. a threat. And Solomon Lane felt threatening in Rogue Nation and he didn't in Fallout. So. So yes and no. Um, in Rogue Nation, I agree with you. Throughout the entire movie, he was like calm, composed, like threat. And that is always more terrifying than somebody like on the edge. The ending, though, when they realize why they've been brought to this like rando little village. Mm, yes, that's know, good. Because yes. Julia, that is yes. so good yep. when they're just like, ev like everybody's face. It's just like the literal like expression. Yep. The whole team stops to hear her voice and yes. so is like, Ugh. yes, oh, yes. Oh, like, cause they're all like, why are we here? Why are we here? Like, what yeah. is this? Why is this camp here? Yeah. Yeah. This isn't, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's so good. That mm. part is like saving his kind of like raggedy performance or like, I mean, really maybe perhaps the writing, not necessarily yeah. Sean Harris's performance, but just yes. like saving the threat that is Solomon Lane for being like, mm -hmm. got your wife here. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So that to me saves that. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. We talked about uh, a lot of stuff here. Is there anything we're we're missing? Anything we have to address overall in the Mission Impossible franchise? Yeah, I know I'm personally very excited for the next movie to watch it. Uh, I think I'm gonna end up having to wait till it comes available to home video. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, such as it is. And I don't know, this franchise has always been, you know, it's really been with me through the years. Like there's been some long gaps between films, but then it always comes back and it always delivers. Yeah. It's a remarkably consistent franchise with the same lead. You know, it's like something that Bond has not really been able to do. Like Roger Moore was in a bunch of films. He was in like eight films, seven, seven, I think, but they weren't all good. Um, and right now we've got True. six Mission Impossible movie movies, um, and by all accounts, a seventh that, uh, in That's my opinion, are all very solid movies. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of a cool legacy for you know action cinema. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like one of Mission Impossible's latest strengths is its lack of rotation. Um, like you said, obviously, like Tom Cruise has been the lead throughout all of these movies and it's really worked well. Um, but I mean, in in these latter half, like his supporting cast hasn't changed all that much either. Um, and I think that works well for this. Like we, we do we had a while where like love interests changed um, and that was fine yeah. for like your kind of like typical spy movie. Um, obviously like we've had different leaders of the IMF and that sort of, that's almost expected at this point, but his like yeah. support staff like Luther and Benji don't change and it's, and, or like uh, Jeremy runner um, Brandt um, hasn't changed. And that's been really nice. Mm -hmm. That's the length of an era of familiarity and like an era of, we are a team um, and some, some continuity so that other players can change or like Rebecca Ferguson's Ilsa Faust has been in the past two movies and this has really worked out well. We've brought back Michelle Monaghan, um, you know, in, yep. in a really nice way as Julia. So like there's, there's some like continuity there that I felt has really lent itself to the franchise um, so that we can add new characters while feeling still like a core mission impossible. Yep. I definitely think that is one of the underappreciated strengths of the franchise is how they're managed to deal with Ethan Hunt's love interests. Because when mm -hmm. what we would have had with like James Bond typically is every movie, it's a new Bond girl, 
every movie it's a new love interest and it's just that's the way it is and it makes them feel hollow like the characters might be awesome self-contained but if you want to look, watch this as a franchise it mm -hmm. you know it really you know kind of diminishes and so they did well to kind of think about this and you know we don't really have a love interest in the first one and the second one we have naya and that's like a happy ending and then we move on and we're like okay now it's going to be like a normal bond kind of thing and the new bond girl new you know whatever in every one but then he gets married and that's kind of working you into a corner but they smartly kind of undo that in a way i think is pretty good it could have been like it could have been lame you know i guess originally there was originally in the script was that she was going to have been killed ethan failed in protecting her and she was killed as opposed mm -hmm. to faking it yeah. and uh mccrory came in because i guess he helped on uh, he came in later and helped on um ghost protocol and we were reworking stuff and it's like that doesn't it doesn't feel right so they went with that route instead of like she's alive he protected her and they kind of came to this understanding like we tried, we love each other. We tried to make it work, but it wasn't, we're going to live a life of guilt, yeah. you know? And, um, it's cool that they didn't just like, even then like that two movies later, we still got kind of the further explanation of that. So it still feels like she mattered and was part of his life and that's there and impacting yeah. without it feeling like an obvious Peter Parker, Mary Jane, oh, the bad guy will always be after, you know, it, it felt different enough. And mm -hmm. then there's a complexity yeah, of a new girl involved. There, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I I really loved Michelle Monaghan because like I, I noted she is like perfectly normal, bland, like you know it's never gonna work out. But it's nice that she's there to like be that like what if for him and like sort of like comfortably nostalgic like if i had a normal life with her mm -hmm. and i want to check in on her and like wistful yearning for without like like holding him back or tying him down or you know kind of hindering the franchise in any way yeah you mm -hmm. know it's never gonna work in three like she's obviously yeah. going to be kidnapped <laughs> right she's obviously right. going to be taken and you know there's obviously going to be this threat and he's gonna be like uh and she's gonna be like Ugh. um but mission impossible hand handles it in a very very nice way it's very yep. left yep um okay well i could go on also, alan's giving us I'm just oh, gonna shout yeah yeah no we're on time but like i'm just gonna shout out simon Pegg crushes his role as benji he is my favorite like sidekick character okay i um he's got uh, heart he's got guts like he's loyal he's funny but serious at all the appropriate moments and i just like sure yeah and benji's one of my faves i wasn't sure of the tone that they kind of sh started shifting to and i think they've done well what someone like Marvel has failed at miserably at finding that balance stakes are there. The drama's there. They can have a little silliness. They can have a few things, you know, even in ghost protocol, it's the glove, you know, it can, you know, like, you know, you just got to go outside the scale outside the window, you know, we got to go. And, um, and Ethan's like, or like we like, Jeremy like, going to jump down. Yeah. And I catch you. Yep. What's so hard yeah. about that? <laughs> like repeats yep. it like five times and I'm going to get you. And we're, we're all of the audience like, ah, Benji. <laughs> yep. But he's so good at that. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Or the uh, MJ, yeah. MJ says Benji's great in the latest one. So good. Oh, good. Awesome. I'm so glad. Um, okay. That's been our Mission Impossible retrospective uh, movies one through six. We'll hopefully be back someday with a review of seven Dead Reckoning part one. 
Um, I've heard only good things. I'm hoping it's not a John Wick 4 situation where I get my hopes up and I see it as like, what are you all on? This is not that good. Um, so we shall find out. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, we've, we've talked a lot on this show. It's been a long one. This is Popcast on the Rocks. You should make sure to follow MJ Honeybee on Twitch. She's been in the chat. We appreciate her showing up. Um, thank you very much. She plays Dead by Daylight. Uh, Killing the Flower, they were a theme song. You should check a look at them on music streaming services, YouTube, and Instagram. Um, our friend Mike, who's on the anime show, he uh, has a YouTube channel and stuff, track underscore mouse. Um, and I was watching his videos of the day. They're a lot of fun. You can kind of zone out to him and he put a new one up there now where he has kind of a, an accident. So you should go ahead and check that out as well. And otherwise, us, like, follow, share, subscribe, review, rates, all that sort of thing, podcast directories, po Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all that sort of thing. Our video version is on Spotify, um, YouTube, subscribe to us there. Um, we're on Twitter and Facebook as well. So all those things, that's a big list of stuff. I should just record myself saying it all so it sounds good and it's the same every time. Robot John. Um, anyways. That's our show. That's Podcast on the Rocks. Andrea, thanks once again for joining me. We'll see you next time. Of course. As always, cheers, everybody.